What, two and a half hours away from the Waterloo final of 1988. We don't yet know who'll be in that final, but the possibilities have become very, very much narrower. The morning results going like this. Ingham Gregory, 21-17, the victor over Chris MacDonald. Alan Broadhurst, 21-13, against Neville Constantine. He's not producing his form of yesterday. And then Cliff Johnson, 21-17, the victor over John Bancroft. Well, no, but it was the, uh, the last game there, Cliff Johnson's victory, was the big surprise, wasn't it? Yes, well, uh, at the beginning of the play this morning, uh, it was still a 33 to 1 outsider, Cliff Johnson. He didn't play like that, so he played like a will beater. He's uh, rather upset the bookmakers, I think, because they were taking an awful lot of money on him, weren't they? Well, I, I believe one, there is one better £200 uh, at, uh, at 33 to 1, that's. Well, uh, my mental arithmetic's just gone, <laughs> but it sounds an awful lot to me. <laughs> But uh, he got in in the corners at uh, an early stage of the game, cut across the centre of the green, and John Bancroft didn't have an answer. We've got one quarter final left to see. That's Glyn Cookson against Robert Eaton. That should be the best game, really, shouldn't it? Well, these two played in the semi final last year. It was 21 19 to Rob Eaton. I predict a, a close finish again. These two have the greatest respect for each other and know this green very well. You're looking forward to that one, I can see. Let's uh, have a look at the players now in some detail. Glyn Cookson first. This morning he was the clear favourite at 5-2 to two. from Winsford, 30 years old, the Wharton Club. He's beaten Martin Gilpin in the seventh round and he beat Harold Horton uh, in the following round. Glyn Cookson is 20 years a bowler. His opponent, well, a young man indeed, Robert Eaton. 5-1 to one he was being quoted, the last year's runner-up, as we said, a Cheshire County player. And Robert, remember, he's handicapped by one shot for being in last year's final and that is a considerable handicap. And so, at the 14th end, it's 15-12 to Cookson, but it's Robert Eaton to play. I heard about it, Noel, that this young man, Eaton, certainly keeps his cool. He's very relaxed, and even though he's been six chalks behind, he's picked three singles, but he's, he's never got a bit of a wobble on this lad. He's always very steady, very composed. Well, there's wobble one here, Harry, I'm afraid shake of the head there. Quite speedy down there, you know. Yes, I know you used to wander down there on many occasions in your successful times on the screen. Uh, a lot of people don't realise just how much pace there is down there. The ball's approaching the jack, you know, if they're not, if they're not almost stopping, they, they, they all kick back about two or three feet. That's right. I know you can quite, quite comfortably play them a yard off there and count. Harry Ashcroft just confirming the lie. One, certainly two now. tight to me is he oh look well but just slid by well Eaton young Rob Eaton just take four singles on the trot there tightly played ends Cookson keeping the end tight doesn't want to give the twos away even so though it's four ends that he's not had a feel of the jack short Eaton stands one down for the second played another two alike awkward to lick bang in front of the jack Hooks okay. got to get round them somewhere or the north yeah, here it goes. fired Could get, easily split them done one again Was a trifle unlucky not to take them both out there. 
the way they lay it was odds on that he'd uh, split the pair of them knock them both away to the sides leaving his own short ball counting the end Sting down this middle. Certainly played some good balls coming back. And now he's leading away. Down towards the north stand. Again playing an immaculate length. Well, that's an excellent ball there. There's a little gap there to go through. Trundle away. Racing, doesn't it? Hits the jack, it would make a mess of it. Only one, but a little bit too much call on there, Rob Eaton. Easily done down that middle. Luke's looking for a good ball. Pace looks absolutely right to me. Good ball. Just that. Slight adjustment. Whoa. We'll now see Glenn heading off into the country again. Well, he stopped the rot just in time there because Eaton had just counted the last five ends. Fortunately for Cookson, he didn't get any doubles. He got five singles. And now Cookson still got a two chalk advantage. 16 14 21 up and Cookson back in the country with a good lead we've tipped this short no legs it won't run short as a carrot it's wobbling about there it can't go any farther Wanted to make it a counting ball. Could well be second or third. Hard to say. They may have to measure that. Unless Eaton provides a winner. Well, it's certainly up with this one. Cookson! Cookson again on a fairly long mark if there is a chink in the armory of Rob Eaton it is on the longer lengths Lynn will be very well aware of this turned away looks near but it's a fair way off that ball just above the jack and here's Rob Eaton with the winner great ball Slack lead there from Cookson. Let's in this young man from Holmes Chapel, and he's doing the trip here. But gets on the bottom, it might go out. It's gone round the back and out. Well, I think Glynn was very unlucky there. Going across the green, it got a, a slight jump. Obviously, some little divot in the green. Well. 
still wide open this game no can't just cooks no though he's always looked as though he might break away this is just can't do it this lad Eaton is just snapping around his heels all the time and leading good balls now well a couple of twos for either man here or for Glyn Cooks and it would win him the game and the gap just when you want a rub or a connection of any kind right through well, I think that's counting a double it's forcing Glynn to try and play an absolute perfect length down the hill now. can it run get inside stops a dead length it wins wobbled about a little bit there couldn't make its mind up might have just gone bit of a chance here Coops he, he stopped a perfect length with that ball on the left of the jack neither player has made any attempt to signal whether he thinks he's on or not so it's this is going to be a photo finish I think this is very very close yes. the measure on the first back on this oh it's near near after a tightening up on the pegs there I think they're going to go back again both plot both players are watching very anxiously here. Gone against Cooks. Tight Whoa. measure and didn't get it. Well, it's a measure of the competitiveness and tightness of the game that the last nine ends have all produced singles. Good length, but a fair width. Got to be stopping this. Gone. Certainly a better road than Eaton, but miles too far. And I feel so sure that Rob will improve with this one. chance chance of it takes chance to win if it takes good ball for nothing that. more crowds really buzzing now 17 each Cookson's always had a bit of an advantage in this game, but Rob Eaton's whittled away at that lead, playing really good balls. Cookson not having the best of luck, finding the gaps, going through. Now he's given Cookson some sort of a chance. Luke's a reasonable ball, but it's fairly well wide. through a little bit but certainly the big favourite that one of Cookson's he, now the crowd saying he's too far can he clip the top ball if he does he can make it or sit Cookson he's done it pushed it out oh, oh, that a nice smile there from Rob Eaton 
Oh, tittle pink with that, even though he's wearing green. I don't <laughs> think uh, Cookson will feel so pinky about it. He's done it. A rub on there. He's not got the rub. One, Robert. Eight, one. And none of those balls there pegged towards the jack at all. They all hung back. Just coming off the top of the crown there, you would have expected them to peg right to the jack. Obviously, a little channel there. It was a well played end, that. The, the, all the balls were round about, but the, the deciding rub just went in Eaton's favour. Cooks, and again, not getting the best of runs there. Went through the end, and a little collision of any kind would have almost certainly left him in. He's found one now. Good ball. Turned away Coots and gone back and he'll be hoping, no doubt, that Eaton doesn't uh, put one inside it. Well, the last two ends he has, he's corrected very well with his second ball, Rob Eaton. Can he do it again? Short. Oh, he knows himself. The crowd have no need to tell Rob Eaton. He knows he's paid the penalty there for a wayward ball when it was important. He gets up to the jack and Cookson now in for a double. Cookson! Two! Well, this has been another tight struggle because these two last year in the semi-final had a terrific scrap. That's a 21-19 to Rob Eaton last year. Cookson led the jack at 19 and, and made a bit of a mess of it coming across the green. And now we've got a, another situation where Cookson's leading for game again. Wants two for up. And Eaton requiring three. <laughs> Left it well short. Yeah, it's a poor lead, that. Looks a bit close, but it isn't that near. I don't think he's beaten it. <laughs> Might have crept in. It looks a dead eat and all that, doesn't it, really? It struggled to get the distance. It's short again. He's given it up. squeeze through that gap there good job he didn't touch Eaton's ball he's still well short with that now Eaton's put this on fresh land in the bottom smack on the road this taps his own ball he can make a double oh oh he's fell the wrong way well Glenn Cookson turns away in disgust there really very unlucky, Rob Eaton's ball went through, touched Glyn Cookson's and Glyn's fell out. Oh, I think Cookson was certain he would count the end there because it looked as though Robert Eaton's ball was going to just push him a little bit more and then all of a sudden Eaton's ball did a, a beautiful flop over for Eaton and fell in. Beatable that. Cookson doing the trip unless he can get a knock. He's done it this time. It's come right for him at the right time. He's not had many of them. Oh, that was well deserved. Looks nicely paced this one. Nicely paced. refuses to go under pressure this man doesn't he Eaton? played at it Cookson 
He can take that ball of Rob Eaton's out and leave himself a double for game. Oh, lucky. Oh, half rubbed the jack. And all he did was turn the block over towards Eaton's ball. Well, those people that have gone for an early lunch are certainly missing a cliffhanger. really wants a lead here 20 Eaton wants one get in the semi-final and he's may have left it just short yes he's a big yard short with that I think Flynn's changed his peg here yes coming straight at it won it yes on Glenn two foot pass Glenn can Eaton pull another one out? He's dug so many good balls out when he's been under pressure. Lovely chance. It may have given up that ball. It looks near, but... Hard to say. Terry Ashcroft on his way. Eaton's not too sure, but I think it may have just won it. Long way short. Measured, Glenn, close. Very, very near. I think Cookson might have been as well having a look at that end, uh, Noel. He's well, only got to touch off. the jack. Touches the jack. He's all, he's, oh, he may have done it. He's only pushed the jack about, say, quarter of an inch towards his own ball, but that could be the difference. Now, they're going to have to be very, very careful here. There's only the referee. Yeah, I, I don't know, I'm not sure. Glenn thinks he's two. He thinks he's two certain. Yeah. He's got to touch that ball, the referee. Thanks, please. Take it away so the measure could be conducted. Cookson feels he's oh, up. No. Uh, pacing round there, Glenn. This is a dramatic finish to this because everything depends on this. Cooks in his game or the match is level at 20 apiece. Yes. Watch this measure. This swayed in Cookson. Oh, what a match. After all the rubs and hits and bangs, he gets the most vital of the lot. And that's the measure for a second ball that takes him into the semi-final. 21-20 over Robert Eaton of Cheshire. Glenn, that was a it was a great game to watch, but I imagine it was a very tense, a very anxious game for you to play in, wasn't it? Uh, an incredible game, Richard. Yeah, um, and to uh, have to play or, or attempt to play a dead bowl at the last end, it, it, it was the last thing in my mind that I wanted to have to play. But um, I wouldn't say it was the closest bowling game um, of the tournament. But um, with it going right to the last end, of course, at this stage, it was, it was very nerve-wracking. You actually won it on a measure, as we saw at the last end, but you were quite sure in your own mind, you seem to be, that you were counting two there. I can normally uh, uh, tell. I'm a, f a fair judge. I, I always think it's a measure, but um, of course, uh, when, when it's either, you, you're either lying up or it's 20 across in the uh, last stage of the Waterloo, you sometimes, you, you know, you think, oh, we've got an eyelash, you know, you're not too certain. Uh, whether uh, you're up, but I did fancy the, the my ball. Do you reflect at all, not to take any credit away from you, that you only won that game by the margin of Robert Eaton's handicap? That's right. Obviously, if Robert hadn't have been given me the one start, he would have reached the 21 first. So I think it's a tribute to him to have got this far and to have played like that uh, for two years on the run. I think he's played marvellous. Of course, you played Robert Eaton in the semi-final last year. I did, yes. I was very pleased to win. I, I've played Robert um, since that semi-final match last year and been fortunate enough to win, but obviously uh, he does enjoy playing the green. Thanks, Glenn. Good luck uh, for the forthcoming matches. Now we can just have a look at the results of the quarter-final matches played so far. There they are. 21-17 Gregory, 21-13 Broadhurst, 
21-17, Cliff Johnson and John Bancroft. And then the match that we've just been seeing, and we've certainly enjoyed that game. What a marvellous game it was. Glyn Cookson, who was the favourite this morning at 5-2 to, to win the Waterloo, 1988. 21-20, Victor, over Robert Eaton, last year's beaten finalist. Well, that's it for the moment from Blackpool. We'll be back shortly, but to London now for the news from Laurie Mayer. The main story is at two o'clock. South African soldiers are reported to be standing by to rescue nuns and schoolchildren being held in the independent state of Lesotho. Gunmen hijacked a bus which was taking people to see the Pope who was due to visit the country today. Bad weather meant that he had to divert to South Africa, which hadn't been on his itinerary because of the government's policy of apartheid. Hurricane Gilbert, one of the fiercest storms this century, is about to hit the east coast of Mexico. As it swept through the Caribbean, at least 13 people were killed. Violent crime in England and Wales has risen by 17% in the last year, but Home Office figures show that overall, crime was down by 1%. Thousands of postal workers have returned to work and some morning deliveries resumed, but staff in Glasgow and Liverpool voted to stay on strike. The next news is at three o'clock. Now the weather from John Ketley. Good afternoon to you all. We're shrouded in cloud here in southeast England, but for many western parts it's much brighter. Quite a bit of sunshine around and the highest temperatures as well, about 16 or 17 degrees in the southwest. Doesn't feel too bad with reasonably light winds, but it's windy down the eastern coast and still a fair number of light showers coming down off the North Sea as well. Rather blustery conditions. Up in the north of Scotland too, it's rather more cloudy and there'll be further drizzly rain from time to time up there in the north and further showers feeding into southeastern Britain as well. That's it from me. I'll hand you back to Richard Duckinfield at Sunkiss Blackpool. <laughs> yes, indeed it is. Thank you very much. We're set now for the uh, semi-finals. Just a reminder, by the way, that you can also see the ladies' Waterloo final later this afternoon, but the first matter in hand is the men's semi-finals, Ingham Gregor against Alan Broadhurst and then Cliff Johnson against Glyn Cookson. Well, with me now is uh, Mike Leach. Mike, it's a, a fairly tempting prospect, but no John Bancroft. I mean, that was one surprise, wasn't it? It certainly was, yes. He was heavily back to get through this far, uh, but Cliff Johnson played very well against him, so that's uh, one of the favourites gone. Two strong favourites left, though. Do you think that's as much as Cliff Johnson can do? I don't, personally. No, they're betting as if he can't do any more, but uh, they bet strongly against him last game. I think he's still got a ga good game in him. Of course, he's got a player, as we can see there, Glyn Cookson. Uh, who we saw recently in the, the last of the quarterfinals. Now, uh, of course, Glynn must be the favourite. Uh, he had a very hard game there. What do you make of that one? Well, yes, it was a tough game, wasn't it? He, he won, as you've said, by his handicap only. Um, and it was, but it was always going to be a tough game, that match. And now he's over that, he'll be confident. He obviously is the favourite. There's a lot of money riding on him. And uh, it's set, so far as the bookies are concerned, for a, a Glyn Cooks and Alan Broadhurst final. Just one word of the other semi-final, Ingham, Gregory, Alan Broadhurst. Who are you going to pick for that one? Just give me a name. I'll be brave. I'll go for Ingham. Jolly good. OK, thanks, Mike. So we can uh, have a look at uh, Ingham Gregory. There he is from Bolton, 64 years of age. The Halliwell Lodge Club. He's beaten Paul Rucroft. And in the quarter-final, Chris MacDonald. 54 years of bowler. He's played for Lancashire. One of the games that got him this far, this is the end of it. He's a good player. But I get the feeling that one error from McDonald is going to be punished. But it's, there's not much of an error in this lead, trickling up towards the jack. It's the most room Ingham's had, and that's not a lot. Only a yard. Well, he's reached. He's overreached, perhaps. Now it might just have trickled out the other way. Again, it's going to be a, a referee's decision. And again, Ingham's going to be disgusted if it hasn't won. This time he's in luck. Now, MacDonald got to do it again now. Gregory Lies game. Just beaten a marvellous ball. MacDonald, nothing wrong with the lead, really. It's got to be far enough, but the crowd tipping this with some sort of a chance. 
but he misses all, he goes out, it's shake hands, he's weighed in, Gregory counted the single after a remarkable match to beat Chris McDonald from Wimslow 21-17. What a wonderful game, that. Ingham Gregory, senior in years, but I reckon if you took a quick straw poll around the green here, they might say, the majority might say, that he'll be beaten by his opponent in this semi-final, Alan Broadhurst from Wigan, 30 years old, the Rivington Club. He's beaten Vernon Lee in the eighth round and in the quarter-final he beat Neville Constadine. Played 40 times for Lancashire, the beaten finalist in 1979, but this is how he got this far. Should he win this game broadest? He's not finished with the men from Bolton because he'll have another one to face in the semi-final and that's Singham Gregory, the Bolton man. Constantine, of course, a Boltonian. Fair ball. Yes, that's a good lead for game. Devil needs to be reaching, probably just slightly too far. Broadus lies game counts this end he goes into the semi-final one about two feet short here would be very nice indeed or even a yard short even though Neville Considine could get round that ball it will be in his eye and slightly distracting is it Oh, he does the jack. He's set the ball and gone out. Oh, that was unlucky. But Broderick now coming forward to shake hands with Neville Constantine. Broderick the victor here. 21 13. Settle down then for the first semi final of the 88 Waterloo. Let's go down to the green for the announcements. Welcome back ladies and gentlemen and the first semi-final in this afternoon features in green from Bolton and Halliwell Lodge Bowling Club, Ingham Gregory. And in blue from Wigan and Rivington Bowling Club, Alan Broadhurst. Tails. Yeah. Broadhurst leads out. Alan Broadhurst in blue leads the Jack in the semi-final of the Waterloo. It's not a re, not a really hot start. That it's a big yard short, tentative ball, and there his opponent in green, Ingham Gregory from Bolton. Played remarkably well this morning, Gregory. A great game against Chris MacDonald from Wimslow in Cheshire. Broadus now retrieved the situation, played a winner there. Gregory just too far with his second ball. Tried to get round the top side. Broder certainly had a bit of a rethink on the tactics here because he shortened the mark right down. Just playing. Oh, good contact there for Gregory. He'd have gone by. 
at this stage a very very important rub won it back Gregory trying to winkle this ball out he's nearly done it oh that was close good played ball Broadus. Gregory One. played the right ball just tried to sit broadest out would have got a double out of it but didn't get a full contact I think these are the right tactics for Alan Broadhurst to employ in this game. Bingham not really comfortable on an absolute minimum distance, 19, 20 metres or 22, 23 yards or thereabouts. Well, Broadhurst is using knowledge he's got of Bingham Gregory's game because they've known each other for quite some time. This is going to be a a battle as much of good bowling as good tactics and good sense two really good players here bit of room here for Ingham on this distance needs to get in here but he hasn't done left to brace Oh, a bit wayward that from Gregory. Certainly paid off this short round peg mark that Broadus has elected to play. Yes, it just goes to show that games can be won with the head as well as the hands. And this is uh, every credit to him for trying this at the start of the game good lead good ball this oh, he's gone through the gap on the peg got round the front ball but missed the jack and brought a smack on the road coming down the hill had another good ball here but not in a good position Gregory plays the first ball, he might sit the middle ball there. That's what he's gone to try and do. Changed his peg to do it. Will it peg up or will it take the block clean? It's missed it. Oh. <laughs> that was a brave attempt by Ingham, but uh, I mean, was it really the right thing to do in the circumstances? I mean, he might, by playing conventionally, have been able to win that. Well, I felt he played much too far through. I don't think there was any need to change his peg and guess at the land. He could have played just a yard through, and if he'd run the block, he'd have made two that way. At the speed he played, he could have knocked the block off the green if he'd hit it. And there, was, there was a case to be made out for playing the same ball as his first there, Mike, because if he, if he plays exactly the same ball, he could have sat the jack or, or broadest counting ball. Well, that's right, Alan Broadhurst had filled the gap in effectively with his second ball. Now, that's the first ball that Ingham's played that's been a length. A roundabout, good lead and a good second ball, but Broadhurst counting. Looking to sneak another one in here, but it might be just tired. No, it's possibly got one that on the bottom. I think he's going to have to play through again now. Changed his peg again, playing through again. Now he's underneath. This game's going to be over soon if Bingham doesn't get a grip of the situation. Been in the final day once before on Bingham, and that was before Alan was born, 1951. chances now left Gregory a little bit of room to play with certainly doing the trip this to want to stop might just go out just can't hold him back on this piece of land Hingham. 
faster this way, of course. That Allen's far enough, but if he hits a block, he makes two good bowls. Bingham asking for information. Level. I'm two foot six behind. Now he's going to come and have a look. If he plays another rambling bowl like he's done the last two ends and misses, it's 15 5. Well, on the starting blocks. Got to try and play a counter this time, but he's played the same peg now. Might pick the jack up, done it. Oh, unlucky. Rodest, one. Unlucky ball, that. It was a perfect ball, really. The weight was right, but it just had a little wrestle at the jack and then slipped away. the good lead coming here Bingham changed his peg again reaching done it this time great sympathetic roar from the crowd they want him to score they want him to make the game close Allen's nearly done it. Done the gap. Might be a bit of a change in progress here, Mike. He got the gap there, just almost connected with the ball. Gregory now could do with a double here. Well, I think he's wise. Gregory, well. He needs a double, but he needs the jack more than that. Would have been a foolish bowl to run any risk there. But that's a, a master tactical stroke from Allen at the start of the game. Yes, he just played almost something and nothing there, but played them far enough. Good balls round about the jack, and Gregory not getting the rubs or the contacts fell way, way behind. But he's led a fair ball. Chances, chances. Just got past the ball, it would have counted. He's made Gregory's ball a little bit more adjacent now. Had another good ball here. Marvellous balls. Plenty of things for Alan to hit, but plenty of gap as well. You can see he's right on the land. Will it drop in time? Oh. If it falls over, it's nearly it. Might count now. Really remarkable, isn't it, Mike? The way you can play balls, they do everything right, and then it all depends how they lie down. Gregory, well. Bingham just exchanging a word with Alan there, telling him how lucky he'd have been if he counted the end with a double hit. Oh, then Gregory. Into the corners. Sent one here. Nothing wrong with this. Oh. Bang on the road from hand. Might have been about two foot six by missing the jack, but what a great ball. One here on the land as well. Just gonna give up. Just died short of Ingham's ball. Fifteen bowl. inches, Gregory. You. Fifteen inch. Two foot six. Ingham coming to have a look. What he needs to know is whether or not he can knock Allen's wood past his own. 
If he can, he's going to have to play short. He can't afford to risk knocking Allen in at this stage of the game. Difficult position for him. Yes, he's played well short. The crowd saying something about it, but I'm certain that he, he meant to play short. He also meant to put it in the road, which it isn't. Broad has to sent this. He wants to run. Wants to run. It can win this. Clear running with a dead length. Won it this. Just gone. Maybe at the back. Gregory still having a look round. Got a bit of a chance. Somebody in the crowd says it's won it. Ingham indicates it's a measure. The crowd will all have opinions there. There'll be money changing hands on the measure. They'll now be better. They're not satisfied here with betting who wins the tournament or who wins the game. They want to bet on who wins each end. It's a good lie, that, Mike, isn't it, from here? Gregory, if anything, looks favourite, looking at it this way. But from the other side, who knows? He, he might be just a little bit out of line with the jack. Well, Terry's asked the measurers to put the measure on Ingham's wood first which is sometimes an indication. They usually like to measure the closest first. You can see any slackness in that. Gregory! Gregory! Another one up to the referee. Gregory now just come a li little way out of the corners, a good maybe 10, 12 yards away from the full corners. A ball nicely paced, smack on the road, doesn't it? Won't be far away when it stops. Very, very good ball. Absolutely hooking ball, that finger peg mark. This is short. short. Lost its way that. This really has been a feature of Ingham's play. When he's got in, he's led exceptionally well. It'll make another. Not be quite as near as his first, but in a handy position. Now, a feature of Allen's play, of course, has been his ability to play a, a bowl, a crucial bowl, when it matters. Might have played one here, Mike. Might be over the top. Might not be in drop. the bottom side, but if it stops a dead length. Looks as though he may have left a brace. Everybody's having a look. Gregory putting the, the shoes in. Not sure Terry will approve of this uh, informal method of measuring that Ingham adopts. But it's a very safe way of telling. Gregory! Well! Well, Ingham Gregory, after uh, taking a, a dose of GBH early in the game from Broadhurst, has really settled down to it now. Yes, it's an uphill struggle for him, but he's led well. He's now back in the game. Can't afford to slip up though, and he may have slipped up at this end. It's going to be some way short. Oh, bad lead. The crowd started bubbling and murmuring when that ball was halfway across, which is always a, almost a certain indication. And this has got a few runaway cries. Bad ball. Broaders must be bitterly disappointed with that because he had a lot of room to work in. He's not really given Gregory a lot of work to do to get in, but this ball's better now. Looks as though it was pegging just a little bit up in the air, but it straightened out and came down the hill. 
as he reached. Certainly bought by his own. A little, little bit to hit his own, really. Yeah, he was very lucky there because he he's got away with one down there, Broadhurst. But he really, if the luck had gone for Gregory, then he could have been two on the card. Again, as we saw this morning, though, what a struggle it is to catch up a big lead when you're limited to one each end. We saw it when John Bancroft was trying to catch up Cliff Johnson. We're seeing it now. Winning ball coming in here. It'll just pass the jack, but it's just stopped in. Four feet, four foot six. Crowd are shouting run away, but it looks far enough. Certainly far enough to win it. Can't lose, it's only a very good ball. <laughs> there must be some worse judges than us in that crowd. They would never admit that, Harry. <laughs> Alan striking. He's very close to it as well. He's done it. Oh, what a brilliant, brilliant strike. Yeah. Marvellous. Just cut that into the side pocket and that gully's his own good deed there that's how much it meant to him a rare show of emotion from Alan during the middle of the game but he he knew how important it was that he should break Ingham's run up Back on the short round peg mark again, and he's played a no ball of a lead. It's not a good one that. Mr. Road, tight, swinging away. He is the winner. Now, this round is an about. important ball as well for Ingham. To, the length changed. He didn't master the short length early on, but he's found a length now. Another bad ball. Gregory should get the maximum here. And the gap then down to three chalks. Doesn't miss Gregory. those sort of chances. Two. First two he scored. Brings him to within three chalks of Alan Broadhurst. Marvellous recovery being staged here by Ingham. He was definitely out thought for the first few ends. But he's bowled better than Alan since then. Not a lot wrong with this either. Good lead. Pace absolutely right. Rodas now looking to play a very good ball. Got a chance this. Clear running, has got a chance. He's just collided with Gregory's ball there. Just had to get inside to count, but it fell the wrong way. And Gregory looking for another. Going to be first of all this. Brilliant. Alan bound to reach. Playing well through. Giving it a chance. Will it peg over? One to Gregory. Gregory! Oh. Absolutely cracking ball there from Broadest. It ran on and took the jack with it and left Gregory with the backwood county.
Ingham now playing the long thumb peg. And Markey plays so well. And he's played it really well in this game. Going to be a bit short. Not a lot. It's not a bad ball. Just almost exactly a yard from the jack. Broadus got this one to beat. Certainly far enough. Misses the ball. Oh, he's got a good rub. Went right for him this time. More than pleased with that. He'd have hit Gregory on the other side. He could have pushed him almost onto the jack, but now Gregory got to find another good ball. Certainly give it a chance. Certainly give it a chance. Might be too far if he misses the jack. It's gone out. He'll be upset about that, Ingham. He felt he'd played the better balls at this end than Allen. Will Allen punish him? No, he's not. He's content with the one. Rodis. Well. 16-13 now to Allen. I imagine he'll persist with his tactic of playing Ingham as short as he can. Perhaps play him to the crown. That makes it doubly difficult for Ingham to get back onto the corners. And that's just what he's done. He's trying to play him as near the crown as he can, so that even if Ingham gets in, he can't go more than 30 yards off his own lead. Played one. Spot on lead. Brilliant ball that from Broadhurst. Gregory got to be up to the end, whatever happens. Not a mile away this. Not a mile away, he's done it. Cracking ball that from Gregory. Perfect pace, weight, land, everything. Well, Broad has got the problems. Yes, definitely on. It's an inch off and you're four inch at the back. Pretty near that. Look at Broadest. He's an excellent tactician, is Alan. He's shown it this game. I'm sure he'll play the right ball. He's changed his peg. Felt he'd got a better angle at it, that other peg, but had to find the land. I can't see any way that Ingham's going to play for two here. He's coming to look, but I think when he sees the position, he'll realise it's much too dangerous. Getting different advice from the crowd now. Carry it, Ingham. Get another, Ingham. Well, it's running. Nothing you can do about it now. He's played. I think he's played a no counter here, but it's doing well. And again. Gregory! Didn't want to be into the end. Now we see the skill of Allen's tactics, although he didn't win the end. He's Ingham made a good lead, 14-16. This is going to be short. Ingham, plenty of room, nice open space there between Allen's Wood and the Jack. Bring him to play in for two. He'd be very pleased if it gets one. It's done its job. If it got too near, he'd have faced a strike. As it is, Alan has a difficult decision. Does he play through? Or does he play for a saver? Just save one. Well to Gregory Lear too, he just saved one there with hitting the short ball. 
was his marvellous stuff now. Ingham was 14-5 down in no time at all as Allen won the jack and cashed in on a short mark. And Ingham's winkled it back 15-16. Anybody's game. Again, long mark, not in the full corners, but still a, a good throw of 45 yards or more. Crowd buzzing a bit now, might go a long way over if he misses the jack. And it's gone drifting all three yards by. Nothing like the leads he's been making throughout this match. Rodders played a useful ball. Looks a bit near there, but it's actually a big yard away from the jack. The crowd have condemned tipped it. The shot. They've tipped it short. Oh, I can't remember when Gregory played two balls as wide apart as that since we've been showing him. Amazing how well he's played to catch up to get within one point Broaders, of Alan Broadhurst two. and then he throws undoubtedly the two worst woods he's sent all day. Is Alan going to put him back in the middle of the green? Just about. Yeah, it's just come across the crown. 20, 25 yards or more, just a little bit over, but stroked it out. Pace is nice, going to be round about this ball, whatever happens. Brilliant ball, and Gregory licked one of these last time, first ball. He's got to find one. Smack on the road. Certainly on the Smack land. Smack on the road. Oh, lucky. And that's a put off. Put Broad has back. just got you're there level. first. That was a perfect ball then missing. Try to play one in the road. A little bit short and in the way. Ingham now has to play the same ball again. Hope to drive his own ball through onto Allen's. Put it down. Will it peg in in time? No. Broadest! One! Well, Broadest went a million mile in front, had certainly had a bit of a fright in the middle of the game as Gregory got back almost on terms, playing with great confidence and then decided to spread two balls wide apart, give Broadus a new leash on life. But now he's 19, 15, wants just a couple for game. Playing down to the fastest part of the green. Be interesting to see if he catches Ingham out with the pace of this mark. Doesn't look like he has done. It's coming nicely, this ball. Just second. Yeah, breathe on that ball, it'll count. Only wants us to touch. Broad has gone the other way in. Doesn't want to touch the front ball. Playing to count another. And lie game. Had to just tie short with that ball, Mike. And he wanted it so much, didn't he? To lie game and put the pressure under Gregory has he gone the other peg? no he's got to touch his own ball wind's clear Mag excellent oh, ball here oh. I don't think he knew whether Alan lay game or not because it's one of those situations it didn't make any difference to the ball he had to play done wonderfully well to keep himself alive in this game Well, he's not led many wayward balls in this corner, Mike. He's always made a reasonable lead. Well, this so. has been his best mark, no question about that. Run on. Run on. Run on. 
The shouting run on, it'll not be more than a foot, 18 inches off the jack. One here doesn't need to run on. Gone out. If Ingham plays a good ball now, the pressure's back on Allen. Well, he's no further than his other. Two alike. Just short. A good ball beats them both. And Allen's been the man to pull out the good balls, but has he reached? Will it reach? He's after it. Trying to get it past. And I do believe he's nearly got it in. Ingham's pointing to his. Allen's saying he's not sure. What an important measure this is. I think Gregory's confident that he's on. I think he might get it, but they've decided to have a measure. He's certainly not got that one. He's taken one out that Allen's would just trickle past. So it's a measure for first bowl. It'll either go 17-19 if Ingham's in or 20-16 if Allen's in. And that's a terrific difference at this stage of the game. Yeah, absolutely vital chart for Gregory's chances. They have just stopped short. It's very hard to tell from here. The bottom ball looks that's at the top of the jack, the one they're measuring now. That's usually a pointer. Usually measure the favourite first. Don't think Broadus was overconfident when he looked at them. First ball measure. Gregory! Boom! I think that was a measure on Allen's part, looking at that, more in hope than expectation. Very good judge, Shazingham. This is the mark on which he made such a bad lead last time, though it's not quite the same distance. What sort of lead can he make now? He's got this one out a bit sweeter, Mike pace looks all right to me it's absolutely perfect land you can see it it's going to trickle up it's going to be a front toucher brilliant ball one here far enough doing the trip this just pegging away now on the top side will go away now Ingham must get another here. If he doesn't get another, he runs the risk of Allen striking and doing the same damage that he did with his last strike. And I believe, it, although it's perfect land, it's going to be short. He's not going to get another. Another free hit for Allen. Two inches! Ingham standing in the middle of the green, dreading what's going to happen next. And Allen, he's not struck. He's played at a pace where he can make two if he hits it. Over the top. That was a very Gregory! ambitious goal. I think a full-blooded strike would have been safer. Well, he'd already had one successful chip out up there, hadn't he, from the more or less the same land. It might have been, perhaps the thought of him whacking his back ball and knocking that off might have put him off a little bit, Mike. Well, he, he obviously played a, at a pace where he couldn't make Ingham two. Now Ingham's come right deep into the corner this time. This has been the mark he's played well. 18-19 now. And it's a good lead. It's perfect land. Just going to stop about a foot from the jack, if that. Brad, very appreciative. They've had a, they've been treated to a marvellous game of balls from these two. Pace is all right if he gets down the hill. He's got to run and run and run again. It could nearly win it. This it's just died on the bottom. They're a lot closer together than that picture appeared. Ingham is in. Can he get another? Not with this. 
frightened. Allen again with a bowl in his hand. Chance to make two if he can just rest Ingham's bowl on the right. On the left as we look at it. On its way. Certainly doing the trip this. Looking for the road. That's all he wants. Down in the bottom. Pick the jack up. Has he made two? Question is, they might be shaking hands here. Terry Ashcroft's indicated he thinks it's only one. Rodis, one! Another brilliant ball from Allen. How many of those has he played in this competition with his second wood when he's needed it? 2018. Yeah, that was a ball under some pressure. As Gregory must have been scenting victory there if he'd accounted the end. Major change in tactics here for Broaders. Looking for a good round peg lead up the side. Played one a mile over. Bad lead. It's really broken the length down. It's little more than a mark. Has to go 19 metres. And this has only just gone that. And Ingham stepped in. Another marvellous wood. I wonder if Broaders regrets just coming along this edge instead of going back to the middle where he's played a few good shots. Got some sort of a chance, this. It's a chance, nearly won it. It's not won it, though. Second. But uh, one thing it has done, I think it's certainly stopped Ingham getting another. He's bound to look at these. Yes, he's walking up. But again, I think when he looks at those, he'll take the view that it's not worth risking losing the end for trying to get two. If he, no, he's picked up the mat. He's not trying. The decision much approved of by the crowd. 19-20. They go for game together. Yeah, they can both get up. Gregory with a double. And Broadus with a single. This has been an absolutely enthralling match with Gregory coming from behind almost all the way through. That's Gregory going to cross now to his favourite part of the green. He's played a mark here about some 30 yards or more. As he reached with his lead. Played a short ball, miles short. Big yard, Ingham. Broader speech says he lies game. And Gregory then got the job. He's tight. He's changed his peg. Tight, but he's on the top he's side. Missed the he's turned completely. it round. And it may not even have won it. High drama to the end with this game. A real shootout, this, because Broadus had a marvellous chance there. Has he reached? Is he any further? Well, I can't believe that Alan's going to miss it again. Well, he lies up with those two balls. Broadus now. Got to count the end. No good in waiting for the crowd to settle. They never will here. No. He's under enormous pressure now. A couple of steps back on the mat again. Well, it's on its way. Well, he didn't deliver it cleanly. But it's certainly going to win missing. But will it miss? But it may well have saved one. Not the match. I think. I think Gregory is... Gregory claims to. He's home and drive. And I think for the first time there, we saw the pressure really get to Alan. It, it would have been easier for him if Ingham had two woods on top of the jack. He's shaken hands. What an amazing, absolutely heartbroken. What an amazing last end there. As Broadest had a long way to get in, didn't take the chance and lost 21-20. Ingham Gregory the winner, 21-20.
<laughs> I promise you that we don't organise it to be as exciting as that. It just happens at the Waterloo. Must be heartbreaking for Alan Broadhurst losing that match 21-20. Noel Burrows is with me. We were <laughs> glued to the screen for that last end. I mean, it's an incredible way to finish the game, Noel. Well, it's the worst end that they've played all match, and Alan's just thrown it away. It's nearly two yards to get in. He delivered that ball, and it, obviously nerves had got to him because uh, I saw it bounced out of his hand. And yet there was an awful lot of sympathy around the green for England, wasn't there? Because, I mean, early doors, he was almost blown off the green. That's right, 14-5 behind. Then he's played extraordinarily well. I mean, running out of superlatives to describe the play. We can see that last end again, as you say, one of the, uh, one of the worst end of the games. It was the most important. Well, Alan's changed his peg here to, to get around those short balls and uh, he's run into it. Plenty of space on the bottom side and he's, he's run into that top ball. Just made it. Unbelievable. Yeah, Alan certainly couldn't believe it. There was a, a few seconds before the roar from the crowd uh, indicated that England had gone through. I don't think anybody could believe that, uh, that Alan wouldn't beat those two for a game for himself and move into the final. Do you think that the kind of tenacity and uh, confidence that Ingham showed later in that game is the sort of thing that will stand him well in the final? It must do, surely. Well, I'm sure it must do. He'd certainly be kicking himself for that last end, but he's got away with it, and uh, I'm sure he won't make the same mistake again. And Alan Broadhurst's feelings are well. Well, be... uh, the only word to describe is gutted. Yeah. <laughs> really. I mean, yeah. what, what else can you say? Yeah, a game that he ran away with and then That's lost right. like that. Yes, well, he, he did it to Vernon Lee yesterday. 18-8 down and came from behind to win and now it's happened to him well let's see if we can do that with the uh, second semi-final who knows we might be able to the man in contention in the second semi-final of the 88 waterloo cliff johnson 20 times a player for staffordshire 37 years old from the chadsmore club in the eighth round he beat stuart brown and in the quarter final he beat john bancroft his win against bancroft was especially impressive glenn cookson the favorite semi-finalist last year 30 years old from the Wharton Club, lives in Winsford, beat Harold Horton in the eighth round, and of course he beat Robert Eaton in the quarter-final. Well, the bowlers are now on the green, having watched that incredible first semi-final, so let's go down to the green for the announcements. And now to the second semi-final, ladies and gentlemen, in red, from Cannock and Chatsmore Bowling Club, Cliff Johnson. And in white, from Winsford and Wharton Conservative Bowling Club, also last year's Waterloo semi-finalist, Glyn Cookson. It said, Cookson leads out. Second semi final. And Cookson had, was in the semi final last year, now he's at the same stage again, and the the betting fraternity say that this is going to be Cookson's year. I must say he certainly got a very, very good chance. His opponent there in red. He's had a marvellous tournament, this young man. Cliff Johnson from Chadsmore Bowling Club in Cannock had a terrific game in the quarterfinals took care of one of the favourites John Bancroft and now he's got another one to deal with here Oops, yes played once won it amazing just got the breath back after that last semi-final saw Gregory dramatically get home Johnson one players on 
five each on the card, 21 up. And Johnson chalking a single at the first hand, leads 6 5. Good lead. Just across the green. Mark about just over 30 yard or so, finger peg. Lynn Coopson there looking very serious in white. Johnson again. Got it out beautiful. It might be shorter legs. It's died. Chances chances this excellent ball Coopson, one. from all the other Waterloo final day and you don't see many blokes that come second time round here in the semi-final again like Cookson has this year bit of an achievement but can he improve on that it must be playing on his mind uh, just slightly he's got, got this far last year certainly must hope to, to go one well two better really to go, go through and finally win it Already been tipped early by the critics a short. Now Coopson looking to improve on the ball on the right there, which is original lead. Nice two. Stopped at absolute dead length. It's Johnson coming up to have a look at the damage. Cookson! Well! Conceded at the end. That's for Glenn Cookson to get this far again in the last four. Two years on the tot out of an original entry of over 2,000 is some performance. lay down properly right almost six or eight inches away from the jack clear running goes out Johnson's had some tough games in this tournament Noel hasn't he particularly in the run in he's had a few hard nuts to crack Yes, he's impressed me uh, quite a lot. I've, I've not seen him play before and uh, be one to remember for the future. I'll be on my, my guard against him soon. certainly slipped away that ball and Cookson now having a look to see whether he can claim a double certainly won
Here's the measurement. Cliff, do you want the one against the two? Eric Garth, one Peter Lawrenson. Done the measuring throughout Back the final stages okay, of this two. tournament. Very able referee there, Terry Ashcroft. That's the Cookson measure. First ball measured. Cookson, two! Cookson, coup. Takes the score is Glenn Cookson now nine and Cliff Johnson six. And we'll pause there as Glenn Cookson leads in this second semi final of the day. We go to London now for the news from Laurie Mayer. We'll be back, I would think, in about three minutes' time to see that game continued and, of course, later on the final this afternoon. Join us soon. The main story is at three o'clock. South Africa has sent a task force into the neighbouring state of Lesotho after gunmen hijacked a bus with 70 people, including nuns and schoolchildren, on board. They've been going to see the Pope, who's visiting black African states. The Pope was unable to land in Lesotho because of bad weather and was diverted to South Africa, a country he didn't want to visit because of its policy of apartheid. The whole area around the bus and the hostages held at gunpoint has been sealed off by Lesotho police and troops. From a distance, the bus can just be seen outside the British High Commission compound. The hostages are believed to be still on board. The nuns, teenage schoolgirls and other pilgrims who set out last night hoping to see the Pope. The gunmen have so far made only one demand, that they be allowed to enter the British compound. A demand which the High Commissioner has refused to avoid any British entanglement in the siege. The SAS men who killed three IRA members in Gibraltar have denied that their victims tried to surrender. At the inquest, one of the soldiers said that Daniel McCann and Mairead Farrell had not raised their hands. He said he opened fire when one of them made an aggressive move. Amidst the now customary security, Soldier A arrived at court to continue his evidence. He described in detail his encounter with Daniel McCann as they followed him and Mairead Farrell on the road out of Gibraltar. Evidence was then given by Soldier B, who, with A, was following McCann and Farrell. He said Mairead Farrell drew a shoulder bag across her body. He believed she was going for the detonator button of a remote control device. I opened fire, he said. It all happened in a split second. Hurricane Gilbert, which is gusting up to 200 miles an hour, is approaching Mexico. The storm has devastated parts of Jamaica and the Cayman Islands, killing at least 13 people. Off the coast of Jamaica, a large yacht blown over by the 200-mile winds of Hurricane Gilbert. Further inland, whole communities have been devastated. Almost every roof of every building in this town has been damaged. For hundreds of homeless, the most pressing problem is where they'll be spending tonight, and food supplies are said to be running low. Five of the 15 people known to have been killed by the hurricane in its three-day Caribbean rampage were in Jamaica. More than a thousand British holidaymakers are stranded here, but the Foreign Office say there are no reports of injuries amongst them. Violent crime in England and Wales has risen by 17% in the last year, and sexual offences have increased by 16%. But overall, figures issued by the Home Office show that crime was down by 1%. What today's figures show is that those who write simply in black terms about crime, as if it's insoluble, irresistible, steadily getting worse. Today's figures prove that they're wrong. The next news is at 10 to 4. Good afternoon to you. Well, a lot of bad weather around, as you've just heard on the news. Hurricanes in the Caribbean, thunderstorms in Lesotho, and there's even now a typhoon in the Pacific as well. But more about all those things this evening. As far as this country is concerned, actually, it's quite quiet. There's a little bit of sort of light, showery rain around in southeastern parts of, the, of England, but as you've been watching from Blackpool, there are other areas where it's dry and quite bright and quite sunny as well. Little rain in the far north of Scotland, and perhaps some cloud developing as the day, well, the afternoon wears on taking out that sun from time to time, but most places should remain dry and fairly bright. Even the showers in the southeast tending to die away, but jolly cold and jolly windy as well. And certainly the emphasis on cold weather tonight, just a few showers around in eastern parts of the country, but the temperature's going way down again. In fact, there could well be a touch of ground frost in some sheltered spots. That's all for now, over to uh, Richard Duckenfield at Blackpool.
And during the news and weather, no significant change in the bowling. Cookson is still leading. The score now 11-7 against Cliff Johnson in this, the second semi-final in the Waterloo handicap of 1988. Cookson just creeping in and winning that end. So we can now pick up the commentary again with Harry Rigby. Cookson 12, and Johnson 7, Cookson just digging out a marvellous ball there to grab a single. Flew by that. Overreached with the first ball, Cooks. Johnson with better pace. Got to win it. Must be the new in this. Yes. Generous applause there. Cookson rectified his error. First ball well over. Striking through the gap and out. Cookson, one. Well. Yes, that was a fairly wild strike there from Cliff Johnson. Leads Glint to send the jack out again to the far corner. Cooks are still happy to play these long marks. Oh, an ex excellent lead. Well, buzzing a little bit here, but it's on the top side. It'll go sailing on and out. One's doing the trip. It's really going this. Gone out, nearly leave a double. Cookson, two. Both Cliff Johnson's balls there, pegging up the green. Talking to Glenn Cookson earlier, he thought that Cliff Johnson's balls were slightly stronger than the bias on the jack. And therefore he was going to take him on the longer lengths which would accentuate the bias on Cliff Johnson's balls. <laughs> Cliff Johnson of course playing with some new woods. He actually smashed one of his own before this competition started. He went to Vernon Lee's shop and picked a set up there and he's not lost with them since. It's all value for money, that though. He's been playing his others a long time and to pick up a pair of, uh, you know, totally strange woods and play at this level and win is a bit of an achievement. But he certainly fired this one out as well. Seems to have lost his length in this corner. Gone through Hello. and out.
fair ball that difficult mark this finger peg into the corner with the woods pegging very very late at the death can he find one the crowd are tipping this and it's doing the trip again but it might well go on the card this if it will only stop and down the hill Harry there it goes unbelievable it's gone gone Hope to have a bit of a chance at one time and all that. Well, yesterday, with uh, a bit more dampness in the green, that ball would have pulled up. The sun has been on this green all day now and speeded up, especially on those little slopes. Another one, too far, drifting by. Yeah, that's ball pegging up the green again, Harry. We just can't find the line. Oh, there seems to be a little bit of pegging those balls. He spits on the strong side, aren't they, Noel? That's just right. Just a little bit. Of course, the faster the green goes, the more the ball will peg. Oh, cracking ball there from Cooch. There's Johnson down. The lad from Stafford. A marvellous tournament. Played some really good balls, but just gone by again Cookson one we certainly had one or two major revivals on here but Cookson seems to be really well in command on this mark. He slapped his thigh there. Mile short. <laughs> the trouble is that when Cookson leaves Johnson with a little bit of room to work in, Tends to fire them past the jack, but he's played one this time. Made the adjustment. Good ball, this. Yes, get some generous applause for that ball. A long way, this mark. About 50 yards or more. Hookson now on the tight side again. Oh, oh lucky, God, lucky me. Oh, I hope he's not bought any raffle tickets. He'll very likely win all the prizes here. Oh, that was a real in off the table leg job, that. Oh, it was a bit cruel for Johnson. Just looking forward to having a, a roll with the jack. And up comes Cookson and gets a lovely jive. Of course, uh, you don't get any jives off good balls, do you, Harry? Only off the bad ones. <laughs> yeah, they don't mention them, do they? <laughs> them that's going to Preston and back and all of a sudden finish at the side of the jack. Want a bit of explaining sometimes. <laughs> well, surely Cliff Johnson can't come back. 19-7 down. I think that's asking just a bit too much. Pegging up the green again. Lies up. This is Cookson now lies. A double that takes him into the final of the Waterloo. 
stopped in the semi-finals last year by Rob Eaton Gone to miss. and now Too far and miss. poised to go in the final Cookson. and it's weighed in for Cookson counts a double here now and he's in the final of the Waterloo beating Cliff Johnson of Cannock 21-7 Well, a very commanding performance there by Glenn Cookson, who this morning was the clear favourite to win the Waterloo in 1988, and certainly he's looking to have the kind of form that might take him that far. Uh, Mike Leach, I mean, that was uh, an easy one for Glenn, wasn't it? He'd have, uh, he'd have been glad that it was so easy and not having to extend himself. Oh, yes, it's a big advantage to have a nice, easy semi-final. He's made it easy, he's played well, uh, but you couldn't have two more contrasting semi-finals, and Ingham, of course, will be mentally exhausted from his, and Glenn will be fresh as anything. I suppose you have to say now that Glenn is showing the kind of form and the kind of confidence that will win in this championship. Yes, I think so. It's certainly his big favourite to win. Uh, I went out on a limb really and tipped Ingham uh, to beat Alan, but I think it would be a brave man who really thought Ingham would beat Glenn now. And what about Cliff? I mean, I suppose that he will say that he's enjoyed the championship. He's done better than people thought he would do. Yes, at least when he's lost, he's lost to some tune. Uh, he won't be going in the dressing room thinking if only and what might have been. Um, he's been well and truly hammered out of sight and he saved it for the semi-final. Yeah. Just looking at the two matches as you did, obviously the, the most thrilling, the most exciting one was the Ingham Gregory and uh, Alan Broadhurst one. I mean, as you were saying before, the trouble is that Ingham might be drained now. He might find it difficult to raise himself again to play in the final. Well, I feel that. I feel he must be drained. It was an absolutely exhausting game for him. I think he was only, only level when they started, and from then on until the final end, he was never level or even in front. Um, and he's not a young man. He will be tired. Mind you, we've seen some surprises in that game in particular, so perhaps uh, you never know, do you? Well, no, I think we've all learned that, that tipping's a dangerous game. and. Uh, He's second favourite, but if he gets a good start and leads as well as he has been doing, he'll put Glynn under pressure. I'm sure that about 3,500 people down there are quite convinced that Glynn Cookson will be the Waterloo champion of this year. But while the uh, gentlemen are getting ready for their final, let's not forget that we've been following the ladies too. And this afternoon we can show you the ladies' Waterloo final. It's an event that's been going since 1977, and the finalists are Barbara Rawcliffe and Anne O'Loughlin. In some detail, there's Barbara Rawcliffe, a local lady from Poulton, 35 years old. Her club is, her club is Poulton. In the quarter-final, she beat Sylvia Royal, and in the semi-final, she beat Karen Galvin. Her opponent, Anna Lachlan, from Birmingham, 37 years old, from the Handsworth Club. Quarter-final, she beat Anne Wilde, and in the semi-final, she beat Carol Brown. We joined the match show right at the beginning, Barbara Rawcliffe, to set the first mark. Barbara Rockliffe in green. Starts the ball rolling. Touching the jack. And there's been an objection to the mark. The very first end of this ladies Waterloo final has started off in sensational style really. Barbara Rawcliffe, of course, in her semi-final caused the long tape to be used like this on one or two occasions. She certainly favours the short marks. There's a two measurers there. Sheila Thompson and Doc Craig. And it's only just a mark. Looks as though they're going to hang the washing out there, Richard, with the clothesline. <laughs> that was certainly worth a shout there, Richard because she played a really good ball you know for it not to be a mark it would have been scrubbed and that it would have restarted the end and she would have got the jack back <laughs> certainly very very handy on these marks this Barbara Rawcliffe she's played well all through on these short marks she's played at it it's the jack done it oh brilliant 
Finally done it. Oh, what a good ball there for Manuel Clotman. Double two. What a marvellous start, Richard. That we had an objection, a measure that wasn't. She played a front touch, she put another one on top, and then she cracked it. Down the hill, lovely shot of that coming off the crown towards the jack, got to stop somewhere to count, just got a nudge and counted. And North Laughlin. Certainly looks like second there, somebody close interest the ladies cry there run away it looks as though it might be tired it's lagging a little now doesn't touch that short ball it's just nip turned it over might have got a double here there's Anno Lachlan looking at the damage could well be two down here Picks one up, takes it out. Barbara Rawcliffe in no doubt. Conceded the end. been very positive start to this final Richard hasn't it I mean that Barbara Rawcliffe picks the jack up plays two really good balls finishes up two down then gets a double back keeps fishing for these short marks all the time Richard I think that she's made her mind up that's where the loot is the kit is there could well be picking the check up if uh, Arnold Lachlan doesn't find a few decent balls relaxing steady doesn't want to do anything silly there's the referee Alice Hollis you'll probably have them pegged but have a slight fancy for the green Ooh, she's ball. tipping one there Richard hey you don't find many women referees that'll tip them you know they just leave it up to you but I wouldn't mind betting she's right oh new ball good and real ball that Shot there, and Anno Clocklin's ball coming over the shouting way. It's on the bottom side. Every chance here that Barbara Rawcliffe may counter double. The two measurers, Glenda Carroll and Marie Denton, natty blue jerseys. Get the string out. That's the one the referee tipped as the winner. Soon know whether she was right. Yes. Two to Barbara Rawcliffe. Barbara Rawcliffe, nine. Anna Laughlin, seven. No doubt that on the past performance from our experience here, Barbara Rawcliffe won't be setting a very long mark. Oh, she's played I, I, in the earlier rounds, Richard. I watched this uh, lady play, and I noticed that she was one of the few ladies in the field that, that played the, the short marks really well. 
Everybody else was trying to go a bit of a distance, but she stuck with it, you see. And uh, it's paid off. She's here in the final and in front. But played a bit of a wayward ball there. Very deliberate, Barbara Rawcliffe, civil servant. Colton Bowling Club found a winner well, this is Anne O'Loughlin all the way from Birmingham she's certainly done a great job here she might hit the jack too hard to see if she's done any damage but I think she's certainly got one too far down the hill and went about three and a half four foot past the jack it's Barbara Rawcliffe now a little bit of room to work in and taking advantage of it this is the winner coming back good ball chance bit of a chance this ball Ooh, it might have won it equidistance those I think the referee's coming across there yes it's won it good ball 18 inch got it down sweet as I not that stroked it away it's got to do the trip this has a chance if it can touch the short ball. Oh, may have just died. Oh, a very interesting spectator there. Yes, conceded. One to Anno Lachlan. The score is nine across. She'll be disappointed with that. But a lot of room for Barbara Rockliffe to work in. Taking advantage of it and played a good ball. About 18 inches past the jack. Now then, Anne O'Clachlan here has got to repair the damage. Asking it to run away, it's not far enough. Well, she's led so well, hasn't she, Rick? Played some good balls, this uh, lady from Birmingham. And yet, she's just made a, played a couple of real no balls there. So unlike her. <laughs> Barbara Rawcliffe steps in, gets the maximum, a double. Halfway stage in the final, 21 up. Barbara Rawcliffe now just a couple in front. Nice delivery, Richard. Swings through, lovely, don't they? You know, it's 
She's uh, left the lead rather short on this uh, short mark. Here we go again. I think they've got to get the string out again here. Again, the ladies in red with the clothesline are Sheila Thompson and Doc Craig. It's their job to measure from the mat to the jack. 19 metres. The referee will declare whether or not it's a mark. 18 and a half metres, not a mark. Well, you probably heard the verdict, 18 and a half metres, half a metre short. So back they come. Just get the clothesline out of the way and then we can get on with the game because that again was a successful uh, objection there. It means of course that uh, Anna Lachlan can set the new mark now. Successfully objecting. But the first wood will be played by Barbara Rawcliffe. to be the right thing to do there by Anna O'Clocklin because she was quite right to get in with the objection she's got the jack set the mark where she wants to go and plays a decent ball there's one here doing the trip Definitely far enough, this could win it, this new ball coming in. That's drawn it. Good ball. Oh, rubs the jack, she makes two. She's done it. What a ball. What a lovely rub there. She just tickled that jack about ten inches and that was enough. Just what everybody likes to see in a final, a good close match. We rejoin it three ends later, Rawcliffe leading 14-12, and it's Anna Lachlan to play. Two points in it now. That's Anna Lachlan's lead. Dead length. Down the crown now, coming up. The dead length ball to beat. Beautiful. Taxis up. Can it stop right? May well have won it that. Even though they look a funny angle, there's the referee. Another quarter looking over, she's not happy yet. You probably have them measured, that slight favourite. Look at that ball, it's so much on the road, you could hardly see it coming up to the jack. But she's left it short. Some deliberation now because Barbara Rawcliffe uh, is tipped to win it. Well, that hasn't changed it, so it'll probably be a measure. I, I think Barbara Rockley played that ball a bit, uh, Dick, with not much attention to the end. I think she's quite happy to count one. She, she'll, she'll be wondering whether the referee and hoping that the referee was right just a vital chart the women are, are there having a bit of a confab and wondering you know how good a judge this referee is but she's been very good through this game all her tips have come up every time she's tipped a ball there's the two ladies in red and the measures again 
Sheila Thompson and Dot Crave. Was right that the one that was tipped was the winner, Barbara Rawcliffe. One point from that Barbara end. Barbara Rawcliffe, 15, 12. Another successful tip, that Richie, by the referee. I think we have better get hold of her and have, have a look at some of these horses I've been backing. She might give me a lift. Certainly done very well. Really well played by Anna Lachlan. Oh. Oh, that was a bit close, Richard. <laughs> Means that Anna Lachlan is going to win it. She's counting one, looking now for the second. Don't get it. Surely not too far. Well, it's been a, a bit of a nip and tuck match, this Richard. It, with neither of these two ladies are really breaking away. Keeps nagging away, O'Loughlin, really, doesn't she? The old one, as at the previous end there. She's, she's just stopped Rockley from really building up a, a bit of a break on these short marks because she's really a bit warm on them, you know. He's plunging a few round the jack, but this this lady from Birmingham's not having any of it. She's she's refused to be uh, overwhelmed in this match. She's stuck at it. Played well. ball she lies two it's on the peg now might go a long way away might win with a perfect length it could win it looks away off there's no decision yet nobody's put any hands up referee there just at the back Please. Yeah, a bit close, these. Sneaky feeling that some of the crowd here have, have, have a, a slight fancy for Barbara Rawcliffe's ball. Here's the, the girls in blue reporting for string duty again. He obviously thinks the other ball's on. He's, Barbara Rawcliffe that takes it. One from that end, increasing her lead. 16 13. sent it never sent that ball she condemned it from hand really she'll give it a long withering look that richard and you couldn't go any farther pity she's played so well on these marks but that's the winner <laughs> chance chance of it stops go a long way past the jack done it good rub that 
looking a bit serious now Barbara Rawcliffe but she she found the ball for the job there went down the hill and won it narrow gone away and out Barbara Rawcliffe, 17-13. Four chokes in the lead, Barbara Rawcliffe. 17-13. Obviously now we'll be uh, preying on her mind the thought of the championship. Consistent, predictable bowling. Well, they started applauding that ball at one stage there, Richard, but I think it's just drifted down the hill and could well have gone out. Beautiful wood that. Now then, can this young woman who's come all the way up from the Midlands to do a bit of damage here? Touches the jack. What an unlucky ball. Oh, I do believe she's. Yes, Raw Clipper signal one to me. And I bet she was really pleased to see that jack settle down. got a bit of a length now this Barbara Rawcliffe she's persevered with these short marks crowd there very interested All watching Barbara Rawcliffe here down to send this ball Almost certain she's counting one. It's a bit tight, it's a bit tight. She's gone on the outside and out. Big sigh there from Barbara Rawcliffe. I think she was a bit disappointed there. She was looking to count another one. One here again on the bottom, can't count. Oh, it's turned the ball over. Could make the slight difference. Could it? I think there's a big chance here, Richard, that the brown, she's made that brown ball as uh, she has. Anna O'Clocklin. I think she's got one there. Yeah. She, she was a bit fortunate because the ball was on the peg and going out, but it just tippled her first wood over and counted one. Anna Lachlan in a rather desperate position really needs to be counting some now. She's 18 14 in arrears. And only a moderate lead, well short. See, Anna Lachlan here, Richard, she's got to start leading some decent balls giving her a chance to get in I mean they're both a mile off I'm sure all them people sitting there think they could play them nearer than that but they're sat there and they're not playing these are the champions here on the green well that's better we just crept in still a bit of room to work in here very interesting come over the top 
Yeah, she blows. No, 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 got some pace. Enough. Got some pace. Gone out. One to Anna Lachlan. Anna Lachlan, 15, 18. Every time you think, Harry, that Barbara Rawcliffe is going to walk away with it, Anna Lachlan keeps stepping back and just holding it up a little bit, doesn't she? Oh, yeah. She pick, if, if, if Barbara Rawcliffe makes any signs of making short leads, I mean, this, this girl stepped in and played a winner. And that, you know, that's what it's all about. It's the only way she's got to hang on because she might start playing herself all of a sudden. And that'd have put uh, Barbara Rawcliffe under some pressure. Jump for it! Jump for it! The winner? No. Uh, died. Only one. She could have done with making that ball do a bit of work there. Far enough. Played up to the end. Played up to the end to try and do a bit of damage. Picks the jack up, it wins. Good ball. Excellent ball. That. Crowd, good applause there. Certainly deserved it. Barbara Orcliffe saying to herself, well, I should have won this championship by now. Barbara Rockliffe in blue from Poulton Bowling Club. She won handicaps in Fleetwood and the local Warrenhurst handicap. Now looking for victory. She needs a double at this end to become the ladies Waterloo champion. And played a fair ball. Good rub again. Just stopped it from running through a yard. Got to be stopping. It's gone by, only just, but gone out. Again, looking for a winner. Oh, it's gone a long way, but it, oh, she lies game. Two balls on the right there. Barbara Rawcliffe now, she's played one here, played one, it's, can it stop, it's just saved game, just drifted by the right hand ball, but it's saved one. Rawcliffe surely only delayed on her way to the championship. Played a, a real ball here for game, absolute beauty for game. Front toucher. Oh, the applause there. That's a really good lead. Just the sort of thing you need in a final of anything. Fading now in the bottom, this ball. A good ball, a dead length, but second. Here's the lady who stands to be the Waterloo champion for 1988. She's putting one round the back, if it's possible. Just died a little bit short. In all sorts of trouble here. Got to hit it full, I think it's all over. Way down, she's jumped in the air. Delighted. 
Barbara Roth up there running round. There's the measurers who've done a great job joining in the applause and a gallant opponent, Anne O'Clocklin, who's put a, a great show up but has been beaten 21-15 by Barbara Rawcliffe of Poulton. The presentation now for the Ladies Waterloo Championship of 1988. First of all, from Mr John Bright, the sales director of Greenall Whitley, to the runner-up, Anna Lachlan from Birmingham. <laughs> and takes that trophy and the check for £500. But the delighted winner that we saw earlier, from not very far away, the champion of the Ladies Waterloo, 1988, Barbara Rawcliffe from Poulton. The Rose Bowl, first of all, and then the small matter, perhaps not so, of a cheque for a thousand pounds. Delighted victor. Congratulations, Barbara. You seemed uh, pretty pleased about that at the end, really. I'm thrilled, absolutely thrilled. I didn't know I could do it, but I'm absolutely thrilled. You were playing... Tell us a little bit about the tactics. You were playing off some rather short marks, weren't you? Well, I'd noticed today hardly anybody was doing little round pegs, so I tried them and I seemed to score. So I stayed with them all the time. You obviously weren't disturbed by the fact that the ladies kept coming out with the tape measure quite often. Well, I didn't purposely do them short, but I... That short, but... I, it didn't bother me, no. Was there at any time when you thought you might lose your nerve a little bit? Because you did, All the time. Lo you did, <laughs> <laughs> you did lose a couple of those measures, though, didn't you? Yes, yes. Well, that didn't matter. I just kept staying with short ones all the time. Tell me, the Waterloo means an mm. awful lot to the men that win it. I mean, it's the mm. biggest championship there is. What about the ladies? Just as much to us as the fellas. It's so important to any girl to win this one. This is, this is the competition for any lady to win. And it must be doubly pleasing for you because you're not from very far away, are you? No, I live about five miles away, so it's handy, really. And you've played here before? I, c I, uh, I have a go every year. <laughs> and this year it's come <laughs> this off. This is it. Congratulations, yeah. Barbara. Well done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Barbara Rawcliffe, the ladies' champion. The men's championship yet to be decided. They'll be on the green in a few minutes' time. By which time, well, about 3,500 people will be gathered around the green. We'll be going soon to London for the news, but you won't miss any of the bowling. The final of the Waterloo 1988, Ingham Gregory against Glyn Cookson, the Waterloo 88. The main stories. Postal workers at four of Britain's largest sorting offices have voted not to go back to work, even though the national strike is officially over. This evening, workers in London will be making their decision. The post office says that over 80,000 staff have returned to work from a total of over 140,000. Letters were delivered this morning for the first time since the dispute began 13 days ago. At issue then, incentive payments to new staff in London and the South East. This problem was resolved on Monday. But key sorting offices in Liverpool, as well as others in Glasgow, Hull and York, remain out of action because of disagreement over employing casual staff to clear the backlog. Postal services won't be back to normal for at least two weeks. Violent crime in England and Wales has risen by 17% in the last year, and sexual offences have increased by 16%. But overall, figures issued by the Home Office show that crime was down by 1%. What today's figures show is that those who write simply in black terms about crime, as if it's insoluble, irresistible, steadily getting worse, today's figures prove that they're wrong. The Labour leader, Neil Kinnock, has criticised the expulsion of the Cuban ambassador as an overreaction. Mr Kinnock backed the removal of the Cuban diplomat who carried out the shooting, but said the ejection of the ambassador as well appeared precipitate. The South African task force sent to the neighbouring state of Lesotho after 70 people, including nuns and schoolchildren, were taken hostage, is apparently ready to move in. The party were travelling by bus to see the Pope, who's touring black South African states. 
The gunmen are believed to be from the Lesotho Liberation Army, a group opposed to the right-wing military council which seized power here in a coup two years ago, a coup supported by South Africa. The Pope himself has not been able to land in Lesotho because of driving rain and low cloud. Instead, he diverted to Johannesburg, so that the Pope is, after all, in South Africa, which was not included in his schedule. The captain of a Royal Fleet Auxiliary tanker that's been sent to help the victims of Hurricane Gilbert in the Caribbean has said the Cayman Islands have been absolutely devastated. The storm, with gusts of up to 200 miles an hour, has killed at least 13, caused extensive damage in Jamaica, and is now approaching the Mexican resort of Cancun. It's expected to hit the coast of Texas tomorrow. Off the coast of Jamaica, a large yacht blown over by the 200-mile winds of Hurricane Gilbert. Further inland, whole communities have been devastated. Almost every roof of every building in this town has been damaged. For hundreds of homeless, the most pressing problem is where they'll be spending tonight, and food supplies are said to be running low. Five of the 15 people known to have been killed by the hurricane in its three-day Caribbean rampage were in Jamaica. More than a thousand British holidaymakers are stranded here, but the Foreign Office say there are no reports of injuries amongst them. The next news is the 6 o'clock news on BBC One with Nicholas Witchell and Philip Hayton. Good afternoon to you. Thankfully the weather's a lot quieter here. Actually, I'll give you some updated information on that hurricane after the 6 o'clock news. But as far as this country is concerned, as I say, fairly quiet. Most places are dry. There is some cloud around, so although there'll be some sunshine, not necessarily uh, blue skies, a little bit of cloud coming across, blotting out the sun from time to time, and even bringing some light showers across the southeastern part of England, where I think you're least likely to see anything really of uh, the sun at all. And the same is true of the northwestern part of Scotland. You must have noticed it's still pretty cool, at least it is in the uh, wind, especially in the southeastern part of England, 14 Celsius, 57 Fahrenheit. And the accent very much on cool weather again tonight. Just a few light showers near the east coast, but those temperatures dropping way, way back once again. In fact, in sheltered spots, there may well be a touch of ground frost, and that's all. And this is BBC Two with News Northwest. Good afternoon. Around 500 holidaymakers from the northwest are stranded by the hurricane that swept across Jamaica. All communications from the island have been severed and the airport at Montego Bay is underwater. The stranded tourists are amongst a large number on package tours organised by the Lancashire-based company Air Tours. Air Tours have issued an emergency telephone number for friends and relatives. It's 0706 240055. That's 0706 240055. Postal workers in Liverpool have voted to stay out on strike. Officials of the Union of Communications Workers objected to post office plans to bring in temporary workers to clear the backlog of mail. A thousand UCW members voted to continue their stoppage. As a result, all mail from the Isle of Man has been halted because it's normally routed through Liverpool. Meanwhile, talks between the UCW and post office management have run into trouble in both Manchester and Preston. The issue of temporary labour was also the problem in Manchester. The UCW in Preston is currently meeting again after talks halted this morning. The 15-year-old girl, severely injured in a fire at a block of flats in Salford, Greater Manchester, has died at Boothall Hospital. Michaela Newton and 17-year-old Simon Ford were both trapped after a fire in the lifts on the 13th floor of the tower block in Higher Broughton. Simon died from fume and smoke inhalation shortly after the blaze. Workers at Vickers Shipyard in Barrow have downed tools for the second time this summer. This time, however, only 30 employees are involved in the unofficial walkout. They're lobbying national union officials who are in Barrow to resume pay talks. Salford City has ruled out the possibility of staging a high-tech laser music show at Salford Keys. The leader of the council, Councillor Bill Hines, says the idea is ludicrous. The idea was suggested by the French pop star Jean-Michel Jarre. He's been searching for a suitable concert venue after a similar scheme at London Docklands was called off for safety reasons. Finally, Europe's top drivers are taking part in the three-day Manx International Car Rally in the Isle of Man. It'll take them through 21 special high-speed stages on closed roads covering nearly 400 kilometres. There are over 100 cars taking part, and they started from Douglas Seafront this morning. The early leader was Belgian driver Patrick Snijers in a BMW, followed by Scotsman Jimmy McRae in a Ford Sierra, who is seeking points to clinch his fifth British Rally Championship. Well, that's our news on now to a look at the region's weather. 
The afternoon will continue dry and bright with the best of the sunshine in the more western parts of the region. With a moderate north to northwesterly wind and temperatures only reaching 16 degrees Celsius at best, it should be a rather cool day. The evening will stay dry with variable amounts of cloud. That's it for now. But join us again on BBC One at 6.35 for Northwest Tonight. Until then, from Zorley, Manchester, good afternoon. In an hour's time, we shall come to the second programme of the series in which Bob Symes investigates a number of famous strange affairs. Today he focuses on Glastonbury, the home of a variety of popular legends involving the Holy Grail, King Arthur and the Zodiac. Now we're concentrating on the stars of the Waterloo as we return to Blackpool for live coverage of the men's final introduced by Richard Duckenfield. Yes, welcome back to the Waterloo Hotel in Blackpool for the final of Crown Green Bowling's biggest championship, the Waterloo 1988. As you can see, three and a half thousand people assembled around the green here in great anticipation. All the seats, all the spaces were sold out 10 months ago in November last year. And the finalists that we'll be seeing in action very shortly, Ingham Gregory and Glyn Cookson. Ingham, that was a terrific semi-final that you were involved in, wasn't it? Yes, very good. Very good, yes. Do you feel, in a sense, just a little bit fortunate to be here? Just a little bit, yeah. <laughs> Not much. <laughs> what about the support? Who's got the best of the support? Well, I think Gold Bolton's here. <laughs> There's been about 200 rounds to me from Bolton. <laughs> Are you going to give the spectators some tips or some information about your tactics in the final or not? No, not really, no. No, I've got to keep them secret. <laughs> Are you confident? Yes, very confident. I always well, don't like him. <laughs> well, your opponent, uh, Glyn Cookson, you might, uh, well, I'm sure you know, is the clear favourite to win the championship. Glyn, how do you feel about that? Uh, I've seen these favourites before, Richard. <laughs> you know, I'll, um, I'll just let, try to do the stuff with the balls. Favourites don't mean anything in a two-horse race. You, you've come quite a long way in the Waterloo in previous years. There is perhaps just a feeling that this year might be your year, perhaps. Well, um, I hope the... Uh, I hope the feelings of everybody, whoever you've talked to, are correct, but uh, that remains to be seen in the next hour. Gentlemen, we won't detain you any longer. I'm sure everybody wants to see the final start. May the best man and all that. Thank you very much indeed. Good luck to you. And so the two finalists in the Waterloo for 1988. Ingham Gregory, 64 years old, from the Halliwell Lodge Club in Bolton. He beat Chris MacDonald in the quarterfinals, and then he beat Alan Broadhurst in the semi-final. That, a stunning comeback in the semi-final. His opponent, Glyn Cookson, 30 years old, from the Wharton Conservative Club. He lives in Winsford. He beat Robert Eaton in the quarterfinals, and Cliff Johnson easily in the semi-finals. They're the finalists. Ladies and gentlemen, we have now reached the climax of the 1988 Greenall Waterloo Handicap, the final. May I introduce Ingri from Bolton and Halliwell Lodge Bowling Club, Ingham Gregory. And in red, from Winsford and Wharton Conservative Bowling Club, Glyn Cookson. Tails, Cooks and Leeds out. It's the start of the Waterloo final. Glenn Cookson, fortunate enough to win the toss, sets the first mark. Thumb peg mark. 28, 30 yards. Starts off with a very good ball. Just about 18 inches short of the jack. And here's his opponent in green, a man who won a sensational semi-final. Ingham Gregory, 64 years of age and plays. What we've all been waiting for from Bolton. A two-inch ball to count. 
She turned his peg. She's not going to do it. Very, very experienced campaigner, this Manning and Gregory. Crowd tipping a double at the first end. One and a Luke. Asking for the string. A bit of an inkling here that Gregory's made the second ball count. Terry Ascroft's the referee's had a quick look at the end and indicated he, he fancies the green ball. Excellent start then for Ingham Gregory. Perhaps the first psychological blow as well. Significant that Lynn Cookson played a, a shortish mark. Not his normal game and ha hasn't been so far. Perhaps he's decided after watching Alan Broadhurst to change his style and play short marks against Ingham. It's now Gregory going back towards the corner. But played a short ball. Got a yard away. Cookson just died. A little bit short. Gregory now looking to improve with his second ball. No better than his other, this. Both playing a little bit nervous, I think, Mike. Just a bit... Was pecking at the end, looking for a good lead. Cookson had one licked. And now Cookson. Certainly saved one, but has it won it? Pegs, Pegs again it. this end. Measure is on again. Here's the two gentlemen who've been measuring throughout the yeah. final stages of the competition, Eric Garth and Peter Lawrenson. Ingham's Eric Garth taken on the left, Peter Lawrenson on the right. Ingham's taken one wood out, which obviously isn't in contention. Measuring for first bowl. And it's close. First bowl measured. Gregory! One! Gregory right on form, played the smart really well in the later stages, the semi and the quarterfinals. A big long mark. Good attempt there from Cookson, but just gone out. Two near us. Gregory stands one. Cookson with the second ball of the end. Gone by. Of course, the most important thing about the Waterloo Championship is the prestige that it brings to the winner. Considerable distinction to call yourself a Waterloo Champion, but uh, there's also a financial reward as well. The winner, 
picks up £2,500 and the runner-up £1,250. Bingham on his favourite mark, it's another good lead. A feature of his play has been his leading on this mark, particularly coming this way. Lynn right on the land. Is it going to run far enough to win? I think it's give up. Second. Looking for another and played one. This is the first of any. Real bowlers. From a long way. Played one about eight inches off the jack. Stands a double. <laughs> Saves one. Gregory! Well! It's been a very impressive start from Ingham Gregory. Yes, Ingham's threatening to do uh, to Cookson what to Broadhurst did to him in the semi-final, but uh, Ingham came back to win it. Well, it's nice to get off to a good start. It, it's a, a big advantage now, 10-5. Taking the first five chalks. And the great thing from Ingham's point of view, he's playing his natural game to do it. And it puts a bit of extra pressure on Glynn when he gets in. Where's he going to play? Another good lead. It's right on the land. Trickling up six inches past the jack. and waving it over the top and as you can see that's just where it's going perfect length shot Again, going over the top, knocked Ingham's bowl. Has it made him two? Only one, says Ingham. Well, that was Coopson trying to get up to the end. He's still to get on the card. Didn't get the best of the knocks there. Gregory, one. Gregory back on this long breaking mark into the corners a little bit deeper this time the ball out beautiful can it run a perfect roll but the crowd tipping this shot is still running going to finish up a real ball this great thing this is a magnificent exhibition in the early stages of this final Lynn not really previously been in this sort of position, but he's right on the land this time. Can he miss that ball? Just rested it the wrong way. Valiant effort, but second. Yes, just cast the wrong way. Just came out on the top. Gone underneath, it could have won. And that would have been some ball. As Gregory led him. Absolutely hooking ball over the distance about eight inches but he's played one short in the road Glynn's played this with some speed hoping to cut Ingham's wood out will it peg up it's close Gregory whoa
Well, Mike, we've had quite a few matches, haven't we, one way or another that's gone where one man's flew out of the gate like somebody gone mad. We got it with Broadest and Gregory and the lad that played Freddie Hume was another one that raced away. And here in the final where it's, everybody thinks it's going to be cut and thrust and we've got Gregory now in, in total charge of this match. Yes, we've seen that there are no guarantees, even when you're well ahead, that you're going to win. And for the first time, there's a loose lead. And Lynn needs to capitalise on this. It's the best chance he's had. But he's been six ends without the jack. Travelling. Travelling. Nearly go out, this missing. Gone. certainly had a real chance there to, to play a decent ball give him a chance of getting hold of the jack changing the land but here's another one coming in he's not going to give him another chance just two foot short right in the land Finn will be cursing himself for not beating that first ball and now he has to play a wood within two feet to win his land's right his length's better but will it run would just have won missing but it's another one down puts the mat down 13-5 Bingham must feel now he's getting within sight of this prestigious trophy yes a remarkable achievement he's played so long in top class company 64 years of age must have thought perhaps the chance had gone but here he is now and with a real chance of picking up this blue ribbon title of the bowling world played a short ball looks near but it's a long way short Hookson now with a chance again to get in plays one this time still a yard off the jack Gregory the way he's played this mark every chance of beating that ball some people tipping it early as the new winner certainly far enough runs the block it's a good ball might just have gone out missing that could be a killer blow for Glenn that hard to beat he's certainly going to have to reach at it and he's played well through Pegged up. Gregory! Well. I think you can see on this particular mark that there's, there's a difference in bias of these woods that the players are playing with. Ingham's probably just a shade weaker, and Glynn's woods tending to peg over the top of the jack. Fourteen five. The identical score by which Ingham himself was losing in the semi-final. Well, he gave Cookson a chance going back here before. Then led a short ball, the end that we've just seen. I don't think he means to give him much of a chance this time. Just falling back. Two feet six wide. Not an easy ball to beat. Cookson's travelling nicely. He's got to keep his head in the air. Stops a dead length. Could win. Gone in the frame, that. Cookson vitally counts this. He wants to get hold of this jack and start his own comeback. Been tipped short this ball, but it doesn't look as if it's going to be much short. It's going to win. It's a tremendous ball. Giving him no chance at all. Cookson finds a winner, and this man from Bolton, Ingham Gregory, produces another one out of the hat. Plants one about Too low. an inch off the jack. He struck. Gone out. Gregory! Well. Well, it's 
spectators not sure what to make of this. According to the betting, the only possible runaway victor was Glyn Cookson. But the reality has been quite different. And Ingham's playing back now the way which has played absolutely marvellously. This is the corner where he's played so well. Particularly coming back this way. He's led good balls all the time and played another one here. Perfect length. Only just a few inches short of being dead level. Cookson got a run. Got a run. Left it short. Well, uh, Glyn Cookson here. With a chance. Gregory finally lost his consistency. Cookson going far enough. He's going to power down the hill. Gregory, go out. Whoa. Sixteen five, Gregory. In the final of the Waterloo, an incredible situation here. One can only start thinking all about is it possible that Gregory might whitewash Cookson? I can't remember it on record. Can you a whitewash in the Waterloo? I don't think it's ever there's been some uh, runaway victories, but uh, I don't ever remember a whitewash. At this moment in time, Glenn Cookson must be feeling the loneliest man in the world. Motoring, got to pick the jack up, gone out. I sense that the crowd are waiting for Cookson to get a single. I think you get the biggest cheer of the tournament when he gets in. I surely realise now that it's almost beyond him to get back to win it. Yes, but look at this again from Ingham Gregory. on the top side pegging away shaking his head Glyn Cookson can't believe it he just can't believe it just a scoreline that you never believed to be possible in the final after these two great players have won through 10 rounds and now at the 11th game one man has taken total control and the other one yet to score This ball's trying, there'll be a big cheer if it goes in. Tried its best. Well, it certainly looks to have a chance from the picture, and it's fell over and it's in, and the cheer a bit belated, but it finally got there. Cookson now standing one. Can oh. Gregory find another class ball here? Certainly. He's nearly beaten it nearly beaten it just won't let Cookson count anything that was an absolutely wonderful ball 
It's brushed by Cookson's wood and stopped about six inches behind the jack. Do it clean. He's done it. Yeah. What a ball. Well, he deserved that. He's definitely got to a he's definitely got to a back coach. That might be a North Pier job tonight, are they? Certainly will be for him, I think. But Cookson there, at least you showed the crowd that the sort of pressure he's been under, and yet he, he he found a ball there that was worthy of winning any tournament. That was a ball in a million. Cookson there. Altered the land, cut the green right in half, come across the middle. If ever he needed to play a few close balls now and for Grigory to spread a few about, this is it. He's led a fair ball, nice and handy. Got a run to get in this. Won't make it short. Oh, Ingham Gregory's been improving with his second ball every time. Two great yeah. balls there from Glyn Cookson. Trying, trying. Oh my word! Cookson. Oh, well. that was—he nearly did it again, Gregory. He's—he's he's been digging these sort of balls out. Regular monotony. Lynn now switching to the opposite corners. Quite a short little mark, just over the top of the crown. Nice little trickle down there. Come through the gap then. Terry Ashcroft on his way over to see whether the ball of Gregory's has stopped near enough to be on, and it has. for the referee to come along now oh, good opportunity here for Ingham just slightly further back take the jack through for two has he gone too far back oh that's a bad ball feet are going in one and a few fingers Thanks. I'm happy about the measure put his feet in about seven fingers in each ball one foot and seven fingers sounds like something up the menu so right, there was a, an occasion some years ago where a man used to wear odd shoes for measuring. He'd measure his ball with the, the largest shoe first, and his opponent with the Gregory! smaller shoe. Well, Gregory was right there to show a bit of doubt. Ingham Gregory now in sight of the winning post. 
19-7. There's two chalks needed for victory. Yes, he's poised to become the 1988 Waterloo champion. After a remarkable final. Saw him kick off with a 13 break. Coopson struggling to get in the match at all. He's found one here. Excellent work. Not throwing them about, Coopson. Kept a good grip on himself. Even he knows he's having a, a rough time at the moment in front of thousands of people, but he's coming out of it with a lot of credit. Two great balls, absolutely smashing balls. Oh, how he must wish he'd played those earlier on. Well, he switched his tactics a bit now, Coops, and he's played the long marks in the earlier rounds, but Gregory has been so deadly over a distance he can't afford to go back in the corners because Gregory's likely to lick any sort of balls he wants to play just a little bit over a length well this is the sort of mark that Ingham Gregory likes really straight mark 30 yards drop short Yeah. I'd have just won it that no. It's just a bit of a squeak. One here that's going in the frame. Excellent ball that. Just got past the short ball belonging to Ingham Gregory. Well Ingham's gonna reach up here if he can take that ball out clean. He could leave himself to just over the top. Cookson! Well! <laughs> now here's Glenn Cookson now, got halfway up almost at 21 up. He must have thought at one stage that he wasn't going to get anywhere near that figure. But now he's just nine chalks in arrears, but Gregory. Only wants a double for game and the championship and the Waterloo title. He's still fighting away. Coopson and played another excellent ball. Another couple of twos to Coopson and we'll find a little bit of the pressure coming back on Gregory. At the moment he's quite relaxed. Knowing he's got a good few chops to play with. Again, Coopson now played another good ball. Certainly count, two together. That's finished in an awkward place. Difficult to get past. Gregory, playing through. Coopson, two! Lynn Coopson fighting back. Oh, very strongly. Very strongly. He's just wondering where he's been. He woke up and found himself a million mile at the back, but he only wants another two or three chalks, Cookson and the Bookies will wake up. They've been very quiet this last few ends. We're back on the boil if Cookson gets two or three more. This Waterloo Green. No place for the faint hearts today. Not a good lead. With a cracking lead fighting on the beaches here Cookson but don't forget Gregory's been in this situation as well won it this Cookson now got to find another really good ball could have missed that short ball 
all that robbed it. He'd have picked the jack up. Now Gregory definitely got a chance here to win the game and the Waterloo title. He was a little bit unlucky there, Coopson. Just got a lick on that short ball belonging to Gregory and it carried it free of the jack. I think he'd have certainly picked the jack up or made contact with it. Well, Ingham had a, a quick look there, taking no chances. Just wonder how high that cap's going to go if he wins this championship. Lingham Gregory is actually right in the position to get on one of the, the marks that he played so consistently early on in the last 32. Now he's going for the title now, Gregory. He's played a mark, sh straight, thumb peg mark, right across the green. About 30 yards, he's looking for a good lead for game. He plays one. Just a little bit past the jack, but Cookson now got this one to lick. Certainly on a road. Stops anywhere about, picks the jack up clean, it can count the end, he's done it. Oh, has he gone through? No, it's won it, I think, that. Yeah, quite a target there. Ingham can go in off his own ball or take Linz out or take the jack. Climbing upstairs now, don't think it can win it. I think it's just gone out, that ball. Lynn must be extremely careful here. Any touch on the jack could knock it to Ingham Gregory's ball. It'll be all over if he touches the end at all in the wrong way. Changed his peg. Ringing Off the on. crown, trying to swing in. Up the top side, but he's played a short ball, he's played well. it safe. Cookson, well. Cookson back on the old treadmill again, looking to pinch a few more chalks. Gets another three or four chalks. Again, we're going to have the match definitely back to life. And Gregory certainly not ready to reach out for the title, not yet anyway. <coughs> Good lead. Only bang on the road. Always got a I'm chance. Enough. Won it. Won it. Just scraped well, it. Surely that must be it now. Lies up with this ball now. He's got one about oh. 10 inches off the jack to see whether Cookson might have a crack at this one he's coming to have a look there's Brian Duncan three time winner of this great title and the last and last year beat young Rob Eaton in the final his wife Mrs Duncan just on the right of him Brian Duncan uh, an old compatriot of Ingham Gregory's from his panel days. Well, he's played, it's on its way. It's weighed in, weighed in. Gregory's won the title. 21 13, beating Glyn Cookson of Winsford. A wonderful achievement for this man. 64 years of age from Bolton. And I don't think it'd be long before you might see his dog come out from somewhere because it follows him around everywhere. We've never seen it this afternoon, but it won't be very far away. Shaking hands there with all his well wishes and people who've known him during his playing career that's covered over 50 years. And so a new name on the Waterloo Trophy, that of Ingham Gregory, who at 64 years old, I suppose, must have really thought that it was beyond him. But what a delighted man he must be this evening. Mike, uh, it was a remarkable game from Ingham, Ingham Gregory's point of view, wasn't it? It certainly was. He, he led so well early on, really gave Glynn little chance and at one stage we were wondering whether or not Glynn would even score. Did you feel, I think you did, that uh, Glynn actually made a mistake in the first end? 
I did, yes. I could understand him uh, playing a very short mark because obviously the semi-final had shown that Ingham was suspect uh, on a bare minimum length. But the mark Glynn chose was nearly 35 yards, I would say, and just Ingham's distance. Uh, at one point, though, of course, uh, Ingham was 18-5 in front. I mean, he looked as though he was going to walk away without having anything scored against him. And yet, Glynn Cookson wasn't really demoralised, was he? No, I can't speak too highly of the way Glynn's attitude uh, towards the game. It would have been so easy just to give up, try and get off the green as quickly as possible, uh, end the indignity of defeat quickly. Uh, but he battled away. He never gave up. And uh, he, he brought respectability to the score and to his play. Do you think that just perhaps the, 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 the burden of being favourite weighed very heavily on Glynn? I don't think Glynn would feel that at the end of the day. I think he would just feel that he was unlucky to catch Ingham at the start of the game, Ingham enjoying such a purple patch. I mean, he took it very well, Ingham, didn't he? I mean, he was very calm before the match, you could see that. Uh, he was saying that all of Bolton was here supporting him. Uh, I think he had a sneaking feeling that uh, he was in with a very, very good chance. Well, I think he must have done. His recovery in the semi-final, whilst it must have taken something out of him mentally, he'd also feel, well, perhaps this is my year. A popular winner, I think, in many ways, because I say he's 64 years old, uh, but he's been playing in top competitions, hasn't he? Yes, uh, I don't think anybody will begrudge him that victory at the end of the day, uh, not even Glynn. Uh, although it's, it's hard to take, obviously, uh, even at Glynn's age, if people say, well, oh, it's all right, come back next year, he doesn't know how many years he's going to get to the final day. But Glynn was still fighting right at the end. I mean, we can see now the last two ends of this final game and just showing that uh, Glynn was still there, he was still hoping, because, uh, I mean, people have retrieved more impossible situations than this, haven't they? Oh, yes. It, it, it looked now as if he'd had no chance, really. Uh, Ingham's leading out. He's 20. He's confident. Ingham, it doesn't matter where Ingham plays him now, from Ingham's point of view, because he's not looking to get any, on any particular mark, uh, because if he gets in anywhere, that'll do. Let's get on that mark, Ingham Gregory had a lot of success against Rucroft, didn't he? He did indeed, rounds. yes. It's, it was a mark he'd played, and it's a mark he often does play, of course, usually for the purpose of getting in the corner. He made an excellent lead, but immediately uh, Glynn beat it. And that was every credit to him, because he could easily have given up by now. It seems that uh, Ingham's opponents were decided that he was vulnerable on the short marks. Yes, it, it was definitely a, a real psychological blow uh, in favour of Ingham, the fact that people were changing their game uh, to meet the needs of playing him. And he never had to alter his game at all. And even there, he very nearly beat that wood. And the great thing about that, of course, he left Glynn little chance of getting two. And so Glynn, Terry Ashcroft had nominated Glynn as being in, but it forces him just to change his peg to play, if you like, a safety bowl round the back. And uh, again, it was a case, the recovery was long and hard for him, as long as Ingham played well and kept him down to ones. Ingham had no hesitation in conceding that. So Glynn's now leading out. Well, it was, it was certainly generous of uh, Ingham, and uh, what happened at, after that, of course, is now history, because Ingham Gregory went on to win the Waterloo Championship. We're ready now on the green for the presentation, so uh, let's drop down there for Jack Lee, the Waterloo Bowling Manager, to make the announcements. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the end of the 1988 Greenalls Waterloo Tournament. I think it's a uh, turn up for the book. In this position last year, I got used to Brian Duncan. <laughs> Ingham Gregory is no Brian Duncan, he will admit, but what a worthy winner. That's all from me. I would like to call on the Mayor of Blackpool, Councillor Bob Crichton, to present the cheques for the semi-finalist of £750, Alan Broadhurst. The other losing semi-finalist, Cliff Johnson. The runner-up, semi-finalist last year, unlucky finalist this year, Glyn Cookson.
And now to present the winner with a cheque for £2,500, Mr Peter Greenall, Chairman of Greenall's Retail Management. Ingham Gregory, please. A delighted man, Ingham Gregory from Bolton. And if his records are right, Ingham Gregory has been bowling for 54 years. So that means he first picked up a pair of woods when he was 10 years old. It's good to start the game early, isn't it, Mark? It right. certainly is, and that's proved it, yes. The other thing, of course, is it was 1951 when he last got to the final day. And it shows how even good players can struggle to get here, never mind win the tournament. Over the past three days, we've talked a lot about the young players who are coming through and almost threatening to dominate the game. Uh, Ingham Gregory's won today. He's by no means a young player. But, I mean, are the days of the older, more mature players over? I don't think so. I think, obviously, there now are so many young players taking the game up, and it's a wonderful thing for the game. But that doesn't mean, of course, that the older players are losing any of their own technique but they're finding a, a constant challenge from the up-and-coming youngsters. I suppose players like Ingham there can, uh, can approach a game with equanimity and with maturity and with a calmness that many of the younger players would find difficult. Well, I think that's certainly true, though I have to say that some of the younger players we've seen here today have shown remarkable calm and composure uh, in the face of quite an ordeal. He's a very phlegmatic character, isn't he, really? He's very easygoing, yes. He's, um, uh, his health, of course, isn't brilliant, and I think that slows him down a little. Mm -hmm. And probably that's a good thing for him. It stops him getting overexcited. Was his performance individually, you think, the best of the Waterloo series that we've seen? Oh, I think so. Uh, he's done everything in this tournament. He, he's won from behind, he's won from in front. But for sheer consistency of leading, I don't think there's anybody, been anybody to match him. Yeah, do you think uh, once you've won the Waterloo title, of course, that's the pinnacle of a bowler's career, but then presumably thoughts turn to winning a second Waterloo? Do you think Ingham will think about that? I'm sure he will. <laughs> I'm sure he'd be delighted to become one of a very select band who'd won it twice. And certainly the conditions were, helped him today. It was beautiful playing weather. He'd obviously have struggled, I think, if it had been raining uh, and the green had been heavy. But it was tailor-made for him. Yes, if he's waited since 1951 to get here. I mean, he was playing here uh, in 1951 before many of the other competitors were even born. That's right. Well, I don't think he'll expect to have to wait another 37 years for his next title. I think he'll hope it'll come a bit quicker than that. Yes, he's obviously well accustomed and well, e well able to handle the atmosphere that you get around here because you do get a lot of barracking from the crowd. They're not afraid to speak their minds and they'll just uh, they'll tell you what they think, won't they? They will indeed, and it's very hard to play under those conditions, and it, he does handle it well. I think there it goes back perhaps to his panel upbringing, of course, of, of which we've spoken earlier, uh, where he's used to playing in a surroundings where betting is predominant, and he's used to people shouting the odds while he's delivering the bowl. And that certainly helped him play in these conditions today. Do you think some players can get rattled by the atmosphere on a very big day like this? I think they certainly can, and with good reason. It's very depressing if you're playing in a tournament and you hear your odds being shouted out and every end you're going further and further out in the betting. It, it's hard to take. Well, we had a look, another look at the penultimate end of the uh, final match. Let's uh, now have a look at the winning end. And I'm sure that uh, Ingram will be interested to see this one as well. There it is. Glyn Cookson set the mark. He was 20-13 in arrears, but he'd been hanging on in, patching together a few chalks, just trying his best and hoping for the best at this point of the game. And really he made a reasonable lead. Ingham Gregory's reply and uh, I'm glad to say Ingham's now joined me and that was, uh, that was a pretty good first award at that last end wasn't it? Yes, I was very satisfied with that. <laughs> Throwing your head back. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I don't know what we're doing. <laughs> well, well, Brian Duncan watching it. So.
Lynn Cookson was just uh, surveying the position, a very important time of the match of course, 2013 down. What was going through your mind at that point, Ingham? Were you satisfied that well, you had enough time to win the I game? Well, plenty of time, like, you know. <laughs> You never know when you lose the block, do you? Really, it's anything for that. That one went through. Wins well past. And that was it. And there we are, the Waterloo champion of 1988. Tell me, it's been an awful long time since you've been in a Waterloo final, isn't it? Yes, mind you, I've, I've only entered it about seven or eight times. Well, it's not a bad average then, is it? Oh, well, I don't enter it every year. I can't afford to keep coming. <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell me about what well, you've got the entry money now for a few more years. Yeah, I think I can manage now. <laughs> what was what was the first time you were here? Tell, tell me about that. 1951. Yeah. Can the you remember first, it? The first time I'd ever entered. Yes. Yeah. I got into the last eight. Yeah. And I said, "There's only one man I don't want to meet in the first round." And the first two names out of the hat were mine and his. <laughs> At least to say me. <laughs> so you were off. So I were off. Yeah. It's obvious that you that your opponents in the latter stages thought that you were beatable over the short marks, were you? Yes, well I am a bit uh, subject on the I'm a bit of rheumatic in my knees and at times I can't get down right, but at the moment they're all right. <laughs> and I noticed towards the end of the game you got the opportunity to go back on a mark towards the referee's table. Uh, that was the kind of mark that you beat uh, Paul Rucroft on, wasn't it? Yes, on, on, yes, on Monday, Monday, yeah. Yes, but uh, conditions were a bit different that day, weren't they? <laughs> <laughs> I'll say. As soon as you use a day? Oh yes, just, just how I like it. I don't like it too fast. Well, the runner-up. Glenn Cookson is also with us. Hard lines, Glenn. Thank you. I imagine there must have been a time in that game when you were thinking and desperately hoping that you were actually going to score. 18, what happened? It was 18. 18 5 down. Yeah, well, uh, yes. At that stage, at 18, I must admit, uh, I, I, if I was going to lose, I didn't want to be known as a loser without scoring. It was going through my mind, yeah. Did you, did, I mean, were you really concerned? Were you worried? I mean, was there an element of panic at that stage or what? Well, it is, you can't panic. You've got to try and keep playing the balls that you think are right, and which have been playing earlier. But if, they, if, you, if you don't score, then you've got to keep playing the consistent ball. Luckily, I just managed to get in. Had you decided in your own mind before the game that you were going to try and win it on the short marks? Uh, not really. I, I know uh, in his semi-final, Alan Broadhurst um, had Ingham in trouble in, early on in the game. And obviously I didn't know that, but uh, I was just going to see what happened when I got on the green, but where Ingham was setting the jack in the corner it didn't suit my balls as much as it did when I was in the semi. Did you make a mistake as early as the first end, when some people thought that you didn't play it short enough? Uh, not really, I don't think... Uh, if I can remember, I think the first end was probably about 24 yards. Um, and I made a reasonable lead. But, uh, I think Ing Ingham just went in, <laughs> scored two at the first end. Plenty of time left. Well, uh, this is three three years now. I've been at this la latter stages, and I like it too much not come back again. <laughs> Ingham, it's the pinnacle of any bowler's career, obviously, to win the Waterloo. But then they start thinking about winning a second Waterloo. Are you thinking yeah. about winning a second Waterloo? Well, to tell you the truth, six or seven weeks ago. I decided that I wasn't going to play in so many handicaps next year. Because <laughs> I'm playing that bad all season. You're going to have to change your mind. I am. We'll look forward to seeing Probably. you back here again. Yeah, the I Waterloo so. champion Ingham Gregory and the runner-up Glyn Cookson. Well, it's been a marvellous three days for us in Blackpool. Sunshine all the way. I hope you've enjoyed the Waterloo as much as we have. Thank you for watching from Blackpool. The BBC Book of Bowls provides a guide to the game with articles on the star players and all the top BBC TV tournaments, both indoor and outdoor. Bob Symes investigates the legends of Glastonbury Tour in just over five minutes, and until then we're going to relax and enjoy some bracing sea breezes. Proud of me, Mum, because it keeps me, it keeps me sane. So you but recognise the strength of the uniform of the 
of the glamour because like that has yes, got but glamour. That's why I said to Catherine, mm -hmm. if, the, if a person's doing it just for themselves, then I begin to sort of say, well, this is too self-conscious. I, I don't know, I'm getting serious now. But, um, and I'm a bit put out. If they're representing something, I mean, I want, I want somebody who's in the army to look smart so I can have confidence. I want the police to look smart and that they're taking care so that I can have confidence that they're doing their job well and they've got um, sort of energy and um, direction in what they're doing. Um, I don't think I care quite so much about other times with other people and I don't, I think, want people to be spending vast sums of money um, on clothes when but I think it could be used more generously elsewhere. But you have, you recognize that you are comfortable in your uniform and royalty also has to have a uniform. Don't you think that all of us have to have or want to have a kind of uniform which we can acquire maybe for five pounds and maybe oh, yes. for 50,000 if we are, if we are weak? I don't know why we need that enormous extravagance. I mean, yes, let's have beautiful materials, let's invent beautiful designs. But uh, does that always mean you've got to spend these vast sums? Mm. Because, uh, well, aren't you, aren't you earning more than you mm. ought to? Me, doesn't <laughs> it? Yes. Probably. Um, um, <coughs> no, I, I, I think it's very... Oh dear, I don't want to get drawn on this. No, Come on, right. you right. must. No, I, I, don't, I don't know, <laughs> I, mean, how, well, I mean, how can Maybe I? Maybe not, you're not yeah. earning more. <coughs> Maybe you deserve it. You see, no, quality I, is I so mean, rare. I, I don't think so. Um, yes, yes, I possibly am being underpaid. Um, no, I... I mean, you can obviously, <coughs> when you get top but of, you can demand what you like, yes, can't you? Yes, but he, he's playing on... Well, no, I have a company. Mm -hmm. I have a company which has to sort of make money at the end of the day. You know, I have to sell to Macy's, and Bloomingdale's, and to Harrods, and Harvey Nichols, and whoever, you know. And then I have to sell to my private clients, and I have to sell through my own shop. You know, I mean, I do actually have to, at the end of the day, sell clothes. Okay. Yes, I um, I, mean, I think you see that... And miserable. No, I think that you have to see everything in sort of relative terms, you know, that somebody who is earning, or somebody, no, okay, somebody who is earning 150,000 pounds a year can actually afford to spend sort of two or three thought 